Hello dears, welcome to a new video lecture by literature.com. Today we are discussing one of the most prominent topics in literature and the first treatise to discuss nature of poetry and drama in literary studies. That is an apology for poetry by Philip Sidney. As you know, the shortest study material for the students and teachers is available on our website and its link has been provided below in the description box. Philip Sidney surely will be one of the favorable uh, or uh, one of the very familiar names to you, the literature students. He was one of renowned Elizabethan poets, uh, the author of Arcadia, Estefan and Stella and the author of first treatise discussing the nature of poetry and drama in English, that is an apology for poetry. Before discussing the core points in the work, let's take a glance on the background or the reason for writing this, uh, this work. An apology for poetry or defense of poesy is first treatise uh, which discuss uh, the nature of drama and poetry in English. In this work, Philip Sidney justifies the honorable position, the honorable place of poetry to history and philosophy. And he defends the importance of poetry against the arguments of Puritans and especially the school of abuse. School of abuse in the leadership of Stephen Gosen started to criticize poetry and drama severely and Stephen Gosen dedicated one of his pamphlets to Philip Sidney without his permission. So Philip Sidney had to defend poetry against the arguments of Puritans and he tried to establish to present his own ideas on the nature of poetry and a drama. The Puritan and the leader of School of Abuse, Stephen Gosen, called poets as gestures and pipers and called poetry as enemy of all virtues and justified his argument telling that the tragedy is full of uh, cruelties, criminals, murders and deaths and the comedy is only for vulgar love. The first thing Sydney takes into consideration is the antiquity and universality of poetry. He says poetry has a civilizing nature casting light on ignorance. It civilizes the readers. He takes the examples of Greek philosophers. They were uh, poets basically and he takes uh, the examples of Roman poets, they were admired, they were prized for uh, leading the society into a right. And he says, poetry can present the perfect ideals for nature, even so the nature can, cannot produce the perfect. There will not be a perfect lover, a perfect student, a perfect teacher, but there will be in poetry. A perfect lover will be in poetry and there will be a perfect man, a perfect woman and a perfect teacher. And one of the important and interesting argument of Philip Sidney is that versification and rhyming cannot make a poet. And one can be a poet without the ability to versify. Because according to Sidney, versification is a fitting mod is a, it is a fitting medium to poetry, but it's not important, it's not essential in poetry. So, anyone can be a poet without the ability to versify and create rhythm. Sidney primarily agrees with Aristotle in the case of the theory of imitation. Poetry is an art of imitation, but Sidney adds that imitation, poetic imitation is not a simple work of copying of what he sees, what he hears, what he feels, but it's 
a creation of an ideal model for the world in its experience. So, it's absolutely creation of a new thing. According to Aristotle, a poet reads the universality, the universal truth through particular. But according to Sydney, the poet reaches universality by the contemplation on the ideal world. The poet is always contemplating on the ideal model for the world of his experience and he gets the universal idea. Anyway, for both Aristotle and Sydney, poetry embodies something of a permanent and universal value. On the functions of poetry, Philip Sidney uh, says the function of poetry is to delight and to teach. But the poetic teaching is an elevating influence and an uplifting power which inspires the desire of well-doing in all men. So the teaching of poetry is superior to that of history and philosophy because philosophy teaches abstracts providing general concepts of general validity in their bearing on human conducts. It's good for learned men, but it's not fair for uh, poor youth. History teaches taking examples from real life and what has been happened. But what happened is not good for generalization. All experiences cannot be generalized. So history cannot present a generalized a generalized theme. Here, poetry can teach us abstract by particular. Poetry presents particular virtue pictured most perfectly in someone which cannot be presented by the nature itself. So the poetry can present the perfect model for the world. Poetry can inspire the youth, inspire the readers, inspire all to do well because the model is there, the perfect model is there. So the poetic teaching is superior to that of history and philosophy. Philip Sidney then takes into consideration the arguments or uh, the objections of Puritans. He categorizes the Puritans' objections into four categories. The first one is poetry is wastage of time. Puritans said that a poetry and rhythmic presentation of the poetry is for just an entertainment. It's not real in life. It's not for life, so you should not waste your time. To this argument, Philip Sidney replied that the rhythmic presentation, the proportion of construction uh, and the verbal coordination is just to polish the content of poetry, just to polish the speech. Actually, the kind of poetry has to teach something noble by demonstration. So, poetry is not for mere entertainment. Rhythm is just to polish, but the content is the core. It teaches something nobler. The second objection of Puritans was, Poetry speaks about unreal and imagined items. Those are not real in life. Poetry always is speaking about unreal items. Sidney replied to this argument that it is less likely to tell lies in poetry uh, considering other sciences. Because history, a historian can lie because he has to say uh, something has, has been happened. A physician can lie if his medicine is not good for health. But a poet cannot lie because a poet is not speaking about what is, but uh, about what should be or what should not be. So there is no any chance to lie for a poet. So it's less likely to be a lie in poetry. Thirdly, Gossam called poetry, the Puritan we discussed earlier, 
uh, Stephen Gosson called poetry as a nurse of abuse, which means he considered the poetry as the source of all ugly desires. Poetry always injects mischievous, mischievous and um, ugly desires in the minds of readers. It was the argument of Stephen Gosson. Sidney replied to this argument that the problem is not with the poetry but with some poets. The presence of such inspirations is the problem of a particular poet, not poetry. He takes an example of a painter. A painter can draw a good picture which inspires spirituality inside uh, the mind of observer or the viewer. And a painter can uh, draw a picture which makes ugly desires in the mind of the viewer. So it's not with the painting by the painter. So the presence of the influence or the dirty influences is with the poet, not with the poetry. The fourth argument of Puritans was Plato had banished poets from his ideal state. So there is something wrong with the poetry. But to this argument, Sidney's reply was Plato banished not the poetry but the abuse of poetry. Sidney justifies that Plato's banishment was just an action against the current situation because ancient poetry sustained some faulty conceptions of gods and superstitions so he just acted against the current the, uh, the the current scenario of that era he banished abuse of poetry not poetry after considering the objections of puritans uh, against poetry sydney speaks about lyrical poetry and love poetry of lyrical poetry, he says he criticizes uh, the futility of the themes of current scenario. The themes in the current efforts were futile in his opinion. And on the love poetry, he speaks about lack of sincerity and lack of passion. And after considering these two items, he just extends his opinion on uh, diction, versification and style. Uh, he's always stood for simplicity of language and simplicity of poetic devices. He said the devices should be used very carefully because poetry should not be difficult, should not be strange to anyone, to any poor English man. The content we just discussed here is a mere capsule of the core points discussed in the work of Philip Sidney. So dear students, you should learn further and read further. We are here to help you anywhere, anytime. Thank you.